Hello and welcome from Troy. And today I want to give a special welcome to some people in Deary watching from their home. We have Pat and Dave Crew, John and Kathy Williams, and Anne and Dwayne White as well. Welcome to you as well as my church members in Endicott. Today we are in part two of the series, Tell All the Truth But Tell It Slant. And this, of course, is taken from Emily Dickinson's poem, and I'll read it to you here again now. Tell all the truth, but tell it slant. Success in circuit lies. Too bright for our infirm delight, the truth superb surprise. As lightning to the children eased, with explanation kind, the truth must dazzle gradually, or every man be blind. Those of you that are parents will remember the time that your son or your daughter was afraid of the dark, where they call for mama and for daddy, and they say, can you turn the light on? Or can you come into my room again? Now, if they tell you that they are afraid of the dark, and they have an older sibling. That older sibling might say, you don't have to be afraid of the dark. There's no such thing as monsters. Just go to bed. And make them feel foolish in some way. But as parents who want to comfort a scared child, if we just make them feel foolish, that is not a way to help. So if they come to us and they say, mommy, daddy, I'm afraid of the dark. Our response can be to love them, to comfort them, to be with them, and to gently let them know that there is no monsters, that we can pray and we can walk them through how God is with us and how they can turn to him. Whenever we are afraid, we can trust in him. And as we give answers, even to things that might be illogical, there's no monsters, you don't need to be afraid of the dark, we miss an opportunity of taking them in the next step in their relationship with God and in their uh, maturing into an adulthood. The truth must, gradual, must dazzle gradually in our explanation to our children. And I would say it's this, this principle holds true in other areas of life. As we're talking to people that see things differently, it never helps, it never works to just chastise or call people idiots. If they're afraid of something or if they believe something, be curious, come close, help them take the next step. And that is this whole idea in tell the truth, but tell it slant. So we're going into part two today. And what we're going to be really focusing on today is the statement from Paul. And it's from Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 15, where he says, speak the truth in love. Today, we're going to be examining what exactly that means. As we do that, we're going to say, see another statement from Paul where he was looking at this idea of food that was sacrificed to idols, and there was no problem with eating that because those people that are Christians didn't believe in those idols. You can just eat the food. But listen to what he says in this context. This is 1 Corinthians 8, 1 through 3. If you know that it's not a big idea, you don't have to shame or chastise people that don't have this understanding yet. So this is what Paul says in this verse. We know that all of us possess knowledge. This knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. If anyone imagines that he knows something, he does not yet know as he ought to know. But if anyone loves God, he is known by God. What Paul is saying here is, yeah, knowledge, it's good. But knowledge that puffs up, you know more than somebody else and therefore you put them down, it's not good because that kind of knowledge tears people down. Paul is saying, Okay, to your knowledge, build people up with love. Don't shame them. And then he concludes this, this passage in verse 11 by making this point. He says, so because of your, and I would say this would be in quotation marks, because of your superior knowledge, a weak Christian for whom Christ died will be destroyed. Another way that he's saying that is, if your arrogance, your belief of the facts makes you put somebody else down because of that knowledge and the way that you interact with other people, you can destroy them in the sense that they won't want to associate with the church. They won't want to get to know who this Christ is. And Paul is saying, no, don't do that. Love doesn't do that. With your knowledge, if it's true, 
then add to it love because love builds people up. In the book Love Matters More, which I quoted from last week, the author Jared Bias says this, this is a problem within American Christianity right now. There are far too many of us who desire to be puffed up rather than to build up. And as a result, there are far too many brothers and sisters who are being destroyed by puffed up people who pursue knowledge as a means to control rather than a means to love. What is one way to know if someone is pursuing knowledge as a means to control rather than to love? If they use Paul's words, speaking the truth in love, as a get-out-of-jail-free card for using their opinions about faith as a weapon. What I want to do now is show two examples of this. Pastors who use their position and their authority to be puffed up, and they claim that they're loving the people that they chastise, but anybody watching this and anybody in the congregation that day as these pastors speak would know this isn't authentic love. This is something else. And even if you haven't experienced this level of manipulation and intensity, I know there's many people that have watched this that have been hurt by spiritual abuse, people using their position, pastors, religious figures who use their authority under the Bible and the name of God to twist the scripture in unloving ways. So Let's start off with example number one. This is Pastor Jim. And Pastor Jim is preaching on a hard topic in the Old Testament about adultery. And he thinks that he's speaking the truth in love. But we can see immediately as he gets distracted by a church member that's sleeping that the Holy Spirit of love and joy and peace is not infused within him. So enough about that. Let's take a look at Pastor Jim. But the fellow just got killed won't do it again, will he? And this is a God institution. And he'd be surprised. Son, don't go to sleep while I'm talking. Hey, 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 don't, don't, don't you lay your head back. I, I'm, I'm important. I'm somebody. Now, you might do your English teacher that way. But I'm not teaching English. I'm teaching eternal life here. I love you. You know I love you. Have I convinced you I love you? Oh, yeah. Well, you better put, you better nod your head yes. All right. Come on. Put it up there. Stay awake and you listen to me. You say, well, he may never come back. Well, he ain't here now. And where have you been? I found a way. And I know that on the calendar I'm supposed to marry y'all. What makes you think I'd marry you? You're one of the sorriest church members I have. You're not worth 15 cents. And you want me to marry you to her? And you want to marry him, and he don't even know where he belongs, and you don't even know where you belong. Now, uh, let me tell you all, everybody here, how much I love these kids. Do you know I love you, sir? Stand up, big boy. Do you know I love you? Mm -hmm. All right. All right, give me a little love. Come on. I'm the real deal. You know, all right, I know you are too, man, but you ain't been here. can't get this in any other church in town. Now, y'all don't want me. All you got to do is tell me we won't have a church fight because I'll get my little Connie and we'll get in her little Buick Enclave. It's paid for and we'll sell what we need to sell and we'll go on down the road and we'll find some little podunk church that don't know up from down and I'll find me a dozen Joe's baskets who don't have a pot or a window and who will shout Jesus and I'll give the rest of my life to them. I'm not interested in recreating the prostitute of the church. From Pastor Jim. First of all, he's preaching this hard message, and it's intense, but he notices somebody's sleeping, so he can't let that slide. He gets down, confronts this guy, and in doing that, in a manipulative sort of way, he then has him agree. You know I love you, right? Right after this, this couple that's coming to him for marriage counseling and he's supposed to marry soon. He says, you're one of the sorriest church members I know. 
you're not worth 15 cents. You know I love you, right? It's obvious that there's a disconnect in this preacher's life between speaking truth and actually loving people. He thinks that he's speaking the truth in love, but it is not that. Now I want to take a look at another example. And with this pastor, he sees somebody talking, and we're going to see him confront this person that's talking in church. And the way that he also will just say, after he manipulates this guy, that he loves him. So here's clip number two. A man named J.L. Went, uh, went into the cheese business in Chicago. He failed and went bankrupt. Hey, sir, what you talking over here? Hey, what you talking? I'm talking to you, sir. Thank you. God bless you. I'm preaching. He went into the cheese business, he failed, he went bankrupt. You're probably the guy that needs to be at the altar tonight. Hope to God you're not at Miles Anderson's tonight. I hope to God you're not. A lot of people are. I hope if you're going to be a preacher, everybody in the audience preach, t- talks while you preach. You reap, you'll reap what you sow. So. Still love you. Amen. I got another hour yet. Let me first of all say, if after a preacher speaks to you like that and he says, I got another hour yet, please walk away. The other thing that you can notice is after this, this man chastises this guy, what does he say? I love you. And then he gives this smug smile. This is exactly the kind of thing that Jesus called out the most within his ministry. It's the hypocritical people that would speak in his name, use his Bible, and presume that they're doing that for the motive of love, but it's obvious that it's not in their heart. He called that out. And again, it might not be like this, but if it was any other example like this where you've been hurt by a religious figure, Jesus is not like that. And as a pastor, I'd want to say I'm sorry that you went through that experience. Another example, and all three of these so far have been kind of extreme, but this is a group, as I show the picture, you perhaps have seen before, at least in the media, online. They're a notorious group, and they're called the Westboro Baptists. And as you see on this lady's shirt, the way that you find out who this group is and go to their website is you type in, this is, this is their thing, godhatesfags.com. Their goal is to let people know that God hates fags and that all proud sinners should repent or perish. Their strategy is all about telling the truth, no matter what. For them, telling the truth is the loving thing to do. Now, so far, these have been rather extreme examples. But let's kind of zoom it in to perhaps the more broad experience that we've had. Because not everybody, of course, in Christendom is Westboro Baptist or like Pastor Jim or the other pastor that's willing to yell out, hey, to somebody that's talking in church. More commonly what that looks like is people that find a get-out-of-jail-free card or a license to speak their opinion, and they might really believe this, uh, their opinion of what the Bible says uh, under the banner of speaking the truth in love. But here's, here's a couple of examples of what this might look like in a more broad experience. When someone insults you at Thanksgiving dinner because you disagreed with their political opinion, they're using speaking the truth in love as a weapon. When someone tells a couple living together whom they barely know that they are living in sin, They are using speaking the truth in love as a weapon. When a parent kicks their LGBTQ son or daughter out of the house, they are using speaking the truth in love as a weapon. Another example of that that happens sometimes is uh, a, a daughter that has an abortion sometimes can get removed from the house. Or if they have a baby that's out of wedlock, sometimes the response is to shame and to distance. 
The final example, when Christians share their opinions without knowing the people they criticize, they are using speaking the truth in love as a weapon. Now, this would be the key as we look at this so far. To share an opinion without the context of relationship is to speak to a stranger something a stranger has not asked to hear or receive. When we know people, when we love people, and when they ask for our advice, then we have been given the opportunity to share. But unsolicited speaking with a relationship that is not personal can be very damaging. In the book Ministry to Healing, we are given this advice. Christ's method alone will give true success when reaching the people. The Savior mingled with men as one who desired their good. He showed his sympathy for them, ministered to their needs, and won their confidence. Then he bid them follow me. Do you see the sequence within this? And the, the other thing that we see with Jesus is, of course, he, he mingled with all sorts of people. And, and the religious figures at his time did not like that. He didn't care what the identity or reputation of the person that he loved had. He cared about the individual. And he didn't care about the label that he would have, friend of sinners, because he ultimately cared about people. And so he mingled with them as one who desired their good. And that, in the essence, is what we're supposed to be doing as well. Speaking the truth in love should mean we've earned the right to share our opinions and values with others over time. But if we haven't demonstrated real and tangible love to someone, we cannot tell the truth no matter what comes out of our mouths. It's an impossibility because truth is love. We can give our opinion, which may or may not be correct. Heck, we can even throw facts at people. But if we are not in love with the person in front of us and are not demonstrating love in real and practical ways, I would argue that we are not telling them the truth as the Bible presents the truth. Speak the truth in love. Ephesians 4.15. Now in just a minute, we're going to break down what this text really means. And if you want to understand it, you've got to get the context, which means starting at the beginning. But as we do that, before we go to the Bible itself on this, we need to recognize that in the Bible, there is a tension between truth and love. There is no tension between truth and love. Because the highest form of truth is wisdom. And the highest form of wisdom is love. Jesus demonstrated that truth, demonstrated that truth is about the way we live our lives and not just the facts in our heads. The priority of truth isn't merely facts, it's about love. So when Paul says in Ephesians 4.15 that we should be speaking the truth in love, I understand this to mean that if you're not in love with the person standing in front of you, acting in loving ways toward them, then you're not telling the truth no matter what comes out of your mouth. At root is the fear that if we don't tell people they are wrong, and if they don't feel the discomfort of our judgment, they'll have no incentive to change. But that's actually not how it works. Not in the Bible, not in psychology, not in real life. It's amazing to me that we're still convinced that telling people they are wrong is the way to bring, bring about real change in the world, despite it almost never working. I've seen hundreds of lives changed by human beings who have shown up to love without judgment, without feeling, compelled to speak the truth in love. I've seen almost no lives change when we begin by speaking the truth in love. When we try to speak the truth in love, we short-circuit the process and ask people to change without first accepting themselves for who they are, and we get it all backward. It's not that people don't change without judgment from others. It's that people don't change without acceptance from others. This counterintuitive truth is exactly one of the points we can take from Jesus' telling of the parable of the lost son in Luke chapter 15. Just to recount that briefly here, in this parable, there is a son who takes his inheritance early, as if to say to his dad, I wish you were dead so that I could have what I would get when you do die. He blows all his money. He finds himself in a pig feed 
And he has the realization, the epiphany, that even his father's servants are treated better than this. So he comes up with this line that he'll say to his dad, Father, forgive me, for I have sinned against heaven and earth, and I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. He makes his way back to his dad. And when his dad ultimately sees him, he runs to him, and the son begins to rehearse his speech. Father, forgive me, for I have sinned against heaven and earth. And he can't even say the whole thing because there's acceptance. The father doesn't have to know all that happened. All he knows is that his son that was lost has returned. And it is that very acceptance that is transformative. And a quick pause here, just in case there's any discomfort around this, because I know people that believe in the truth want to make sure that that's known or else it can make us feel very uncomfortable. So a distinction that's important to know here is there is a huge difference between acceptance and approval. There should be an unlimited acceptance for those within the church community. But that does not mean that we have to pretend to approve of everything wrong that people do. But when there is this acceptance, like the kind that is demonstrated by the father to the prodigal, that is what actually is the transformative agent. So let's take a look now at what the context of this statement from Paul in Ephesians 4.15 is all about. Now if you have your Bibles, and if you read from the NIV translation, you'll see the heading that begins in Ephesians chapter 4 is unity and maturity in the body of Christ. So the translators there give us a clue of what this whole context is about. This is about unity, and this is about growth into Jesus. So the beginning of Ephesians 4 starts like this. As a prisoner for the Lord, then I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called to one hope when you were were called. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. So whatever speaking in the truth, the truth and love means, it cannot be separated from these traits. We, We see this right at the beginning. Being humble being gentle, being patient, bearing with one another in love, and making every effort to keep unity through the bonds of peace. So, so just at the beginning, just recognize now, if we have something that's just, we, we really need to tell somebody, and it, they, they might have a different opinion, they might be doing something that we think is wrong. Paul is guiding us here, the Bible is guiding us here, of what that kind of conversation would look like and what we would need to be committed to. We need to be committed to being humble and gentle and patient, bearing with one another in love, and making every effort to keep unity. That's what we see at the start as we explore the meaning of speaking the truth in love. Now, zooming in on verse 15 and 16, let's take a look at what Paul actually says here. Instead, speaking the truth in love, we will grow to become in every respect the mature body of him who is the head, that is, Christ. From him the whole body, joined and held together by every supporting ligament, grows and builds itself up in love as each part does it, its work. Paul is telling us the, the whole goal of being a Christian is to mature to a reflection of our head, and that is Christ. That's the whole point. That's what it means to speak the truth in love. This is an integrity thing. It's not just about words. It's about the whole being, the whole body of Christ coming together to reflect the essence of actually who Jesus is. Now, the the end of the passage also gives us some clarifying marks. Um, Speaking the truth in love, in verse 25, put away falsehood and speak the truth your neighbors. Verse 26, be angry, but don't sin in your anger. Verse 28, thieves should give up stealing so they can work and give to the needy. 
Verse 29, let no evil talk come out of your mouth, but only what builds others up. Get rid of all bitterness, wrath, slander, and malice. Be kind, compassionate, and forgiving. That's the context. What does it mean to speak truth in love? It's to strive for unity and to reflect Jesus Christ. Truth in the Bible is almost always referring to honest speech or simply not lying. We see this here as well. So when the Bible in general says to speak the truth, it's not saying tell people your opinion, but rather don't intentionally lie to people. So let's take a look at an example of what that might look like. Let's say one of your friends comes up to you and this friend is not married and he tells you, there's this girl that I really like and I want to live with her. I don't know if I want to get married because my parents tried that and it didn't work out that well. And I think I just want to live with her and not get married. What do you think? Now, if this is your friend and your friend has come to you and you have the context of having a relationship and he's actually asking for your advice, you can humbly let him know, first of all, that you don't have all the answers because you are not God. But you can, because he's asked your advice, share your opinions and what your interpretation of the Bible might say. And you could warn him about some things, about perhaps why a commitment does make a difference and those vows to hold and to honor as long as you both shall live can be a glue that can help even in bad times. Even if it didn't work for other people, there is something sacred to that vow and commitment in marriage. He's asking for the advice, and so you can give it. Now, that's very different than the context of somebody that doesn't know you, who you found out is living with a partner, and without having the context of relationship, you go up to them and say, that's a sin. That's a different thing, because they don't know you. They didn't ask for your opinion. But in the context of a relationship where you've earned respect and you've earned trust, you can humbly share and prayerfully share the things that you're convinced of because they're asking for it and because there's a relationship there that you can build on. Paul, in 1 Corinthians 5, verse 12, clarifies this further when he says, For what have I to do with judging outsiders? Is it not those inside the church whom you are to judge? Paul's not asking a rhetorical question. He's answering it. And he's saying, hey, Christians, don't be criticizing, don't be judging those who don't believe like you. That's not your role. Stay in your lane. Now, if somebody is part of the church, yeah, we can, and part of the role of the church is to build each other up in unity, to speak the truth in love in unity, with kindness, with compassion. But somebody that doesn't believe like us, doesn't believe the Bible, doesn't believe in Jesus, who are you to judge? Paul says don't do it, because that causes harm. In closing, I want to share two texts that end with the same idea of how to cover a multitude of sins. This first one comes from Jesus' brother James, and it's from James 5, 19 through 20. I'll read it and then give a little bit of context. James says, My brothers, if anyone among you wanders from the truth and someone brings him back, let him know that whoever brings back a sinner from his wandering will save his soul from death and will cover a multitude of sins. The context. Just today, before the sermon, I had the privilege of being part of an anointing service. And the thing that I always stress in an anointing service is the need for reconciliation, where James says, confess your faults to one another and you will be healed. A lot of times, and, and this is actually just before in, in James chapter 5 where, where James says this, a lot of times we, we think anointing is just for the very sick physically people. But what James is saying here is sometimes our sickness comes in the form 
of separation, of relational strife. And what James is encouraging is for us to have healing even there. You'll remember some of the most amazing miracles of Jesus is not when he heals somebody that can't see and and he makes them able to see or somebody that's lame and he makes them able to walk. He does those things, he says, so that we can know that he has the power to forgive sins. That's the greater miracle. And when we have something that has not been reconciled, a relationship that's in tension, and we pray for healing with that, and we pray for forgiveness of sins, that is incredible when we find the peace and the restoration of relationship. When we do that, as James ends, when we help bring a sinner back from his wandering, it will save his soul from death and will cover a multitude of sins. That's the way that James says it. Now take a look at the way that Peter essentially says the same thing. 1 Peter 4, verse 8. Most important of all, continue to show deep love for each other. For love covers a multitude of sins. Sometimes we have stressed this component of speaking the truth, but the only way to actually, in verity, speak the truth is to live it in the way that we love people. When we love people, they will know it. And when we love people, that covers a multitude of sins because it can restore broken relationships. It encourages us, if we've made a mistake, to confess our faults. You know, when I said that, I'm sorry. What is that? That's the truth motivated by love. Reconciliation. Love covers a multitude of sins. And that is the only way to truly speak the truth in love. Tell all the truth, but tell it slant. This has been part two. And next week, I will conclude this sermon with part three. But let's conclude now with prayer. Dear Father in heaven, once again, I am reminded that we've all fallen short. It's easy for me to give an example of a pastor that's being extreme. But as I search my own heart, I know that I've not always been perfect. I've said inappropriate things. I've made judgments. I've hurt people. And so we've all fallen short, and we need help. We need your forgiveness. But Lord, we want to be authentic Christians. We don't want to use speaking the truth as a get-out-of-jail-free card to love people. And I don't want this church to be the kind of church that can keep people out. We want to open up the doors and let people in so they can have a relationship with you. Be with us, Lord, where we've fallen short. May you redeem us. May you give us your power to overcome. People listening to this today that have been hurt within their church, bring healing and help us to remember that people fail. We can keep our eyes on you. You offer hope and healing. So we pray these things, Jesus, in your name. 